don't think of automation of right as, as a time saving technique. It's a transfer of knowledge. Okay. You, um, yeah. If you know how to do an analysis by clicky, 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 clicking, I don't know how to do that analysis. But if you were to take the time to get the code to me somehow, then, then it's a way of you saying, this is everything you need to know to do what I can do. You're transferring knowledge to me. Because Crouch's law is, um, uh, I can be an idiot and I will make mistakes. Um, and mm. this is, if you like, the, the premise of all of the software engineering practices that go on to follow. Um, but Crouch's law has a corollary and that is you are no different. Most of the time, or sometimes, engineers are not actually talented coders. So today, Mike Croucher will walk you kind of through a, I would call it a framework maybe, how you can become a better coder. So Mike, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you, Yosef. Can you give the audience maybe a bit of a background? Like, who's Mike? What are you doing at the moment at MathWorks? And yeah, what are you up yeah, to? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, yeah, so um, I uh, worked at MathWorks for the last three years. Um, before then, I spent about uh, nearly 20 years in academia. So I started off with a PhD in uh, theoretical physics. Um, but I was one of those PhD students that near the end of my uh, PhD, my supervisor said to me, you're, a, you're more of a computer scientist than you are a physicist, because I spent so much time writing code and not enough time uh, writing papers um, and, and actually thinking about physics. And I think uh, she, she was exactly right. That, that was, that was the, the state that I was in. And so rather than going on to become a research physicist, I went and worked at the University of Manchester um, in computational support. So um, working with the high performance computing department, um, working with people that was teaching introductory Perl. I did an introductory Perl course way back then that I used to teach people. Um, I, uh, I taught MATLAB, I taught Python, I taught all kinds of things. Um, and then uh, over the years, I got more and more involved with what I call the, the, the long tail scientists. So that, uh, what that means is sort of the, the vast majority of scientists and engineers out there, um, they, they're not coding experts, but they have to use coding. So they'll do you know, a little bit of MATLAB or a little bit of Python or um, Perl, Mathematica. I did all kinds of different things, um, but it wasn't their specialism. And I would work with like helping them just improve a little bit more. Um, uh, very often, the reason why people would come to me is because they, they needed things to go faster. That would be the initial uh, way that uh, people would get started. And so... I kind of did this kind of work for uh, quite a few more years. I got involved with an organization called the Software Sustainability Institute in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, they pretty much exist solely to improve research software. That, that was why they were created um, back in 2010. Um, and from there, I got a fellowship some called a, from a funding body called the EPSRC. So I got a research software engineering fellowship which I used to found the Research Software Engineering Group at the University of Sheffield. So then that was a group of people um, where all we did was um, teach people how to uh, improve their code. We actually got funding to work on their projects with them and so on and so forth. That group's still going. It's uh, going really strong. Um, doesn't need me anymore, so I'm quite happy about that. Um, and, but at some point, I felt like it was time to move on. And um, I ended up at, uh, at MathWorks. They said, um, how would you like to, all that great stuff you've been doing in academia, how would you like to continue doing it, but, but working for us? So um, yeah, that's why I'm at MathWorks now. Very good. I also like the subliminal message in the background, like Python for MATLAB development in MATLAB. <laughs> And I think the other book is the one from Steve Brunton, right? If I'm not yeah, mistaken. that's right. Yeah, data-driven science and engineering. It's a it's a fantastic yeah. book. So uh, yeah, um, the uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of different. Uh, um, uh, what else have I got there? I've got optimized C plus plus books on algorithms, linear algebra, accelerating MATLAB performance is just. I mean, you can only just see it here. Um, along with some of my old physics books as well, quantum physics, quantum mechanics, and so on. So you kind of get the idea. I'm a, a physicist that, that ended up coding and, and then over the years sort of 
and helping advise people on how to code. So, yeah. Yeah. Really cool. What I really like about you, Mike, in your presentations on YouTube that I've seen is you put a lot of memes in your presentation, but also a lot of anecdotes. And one of the anecdotes you talked about is kind of the Excel error that kind of changed history. Can you maybe talk the, about that Excel error and why it was actually crucial to kind of share code in the first place and actually share it with another team or department and work on that code? Yeah, so that was one that... Um... So the, the talk that you're referring to is a talk that I started giving in about 2015 called Is Your Research Software Correct? And mm -hmm. um, the, uh, um, the, the, the sort of original thing that inspired that was I, I remember reading in the literature um, about a Python, I'm sorry, Python, about a paper um, called, uh, it's called Growth in a Time of Debt, I think, by two economists from Harvard called um, Reidhart and Rogoff. And um, this, this paper was a really big deal. It sort of helped form much of the uh, economic politics of the day. People were using the results of this paper to justify austerity measures in various countries. I mean, not just this paper. It, it was part of the, um, the argument for justifying the austerity measures and so on. And... Um, essentially what it said was, is I'm just going to read this here to make sure that I don't uh, make a mistake. They said that um, countries with a public debt of 90% of GDP or more tend to experience a slower growth rate um, uh, than if you had less public debt. And so that led to people saying, so we need to reduce public debt. Um, and so the story goes is that not long after the publication, there was a... Um, there were a couple of students or postdocs, I forget who they are, unfortunately, um, who attempted to replicate the work of Reinhardt and Rogoff. Um, because, you know, the, the mathematics and so on was fairly straightforward. The data was available. And try as they might, they couldn't replicate it. And so obviously they felt, well, this is because we don't know what we're doing. We can't replicate the work of these fantastic um, economists and so on. And so they reached out to the, the original authors and they said, could we take a look at your, your data? And um, uh, the, the authors responded. They said, yeah, here's our data and all of our analysis, because it was in the same thing. It was an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and after just looking at it for a relatively short um, amount of time, they discovered that Reinhardt and Rogoff had missed off data points. Um, so they'd made a mistake in creating their Excel formula. And I don't exactly know what the mistake is, but you can imagine that it's on the line of you know, when you drag down, uh, you, you've got to take the mean of a, of a column in Excel and you just click and you drag it down. Well, mm -hmm. imagine if you didn't drag it down all the way, you know, you missed off mm -hmm. some major countries. And so you made it. Um, so essentially then um, their, their analysis was, was incorrect because of, a, of, of what amounts to a coding mistake in Excel. And this uh, apparently changed the, the results. So the actual data suggested using their exact analysis, instead of um, a slower growth rate, it actually showed a positive rate of 2.2% instead of a negative rate of 0.1%. Um, since then, there have been lots of discussions and arguments and so on that go way over my head as to you know, what, this what the correct analysis should be. But what really stood out to me is that over the years I've seen hundreds of engineers and researchers and so on make use of tools like Excel to do their research. Um, and that's the kind of mistake that any one of us could have made. Um, certainly, you know, and these mistakes, Reinhardt and Rogoff mistake was one that got caught, but imagine all of the stuff that's out there that didn't get caught. Mm -hmm. um, and then I kind of got obsessed with co collecting this kind of story. So I started like finding stories of, um, of small and simple coding errors, the kind of thing that any one of us could make, um, but that had large implications. So um, yeah, uh, and, and from there, I then sort of tried to come up with, uh, uh, let's see if we, can, if we can learn something from these stories to improve the way that we all do engineering and, and computational research. Mm -hmm. One of the learnings probably be like learning to code properly, whatever that means. So one, what would be the learnings for you, Mike, maybe to the audience? 
like how to actually start coding? Why would we code in the first place? How do we automate tasks? Is it just simply for automation or is there something else apart from that? Um, so going, going back to the Excel um, uh, e example, I think, you know, some people will argue, oh, well, they shouldn't have used Excel because if, if ever you, if ever somebody makes a mistake with a set of tools, um, then you'll always have some group of people that will argue because they chose the wrong tool, right? If somebody were to make mm -hmm. a mistake and it was MATLAB, people will say, oh, it's because you use MATLAB. Oh, it's very funny. Um, so some people will target your choice of tools. Um, in, in this case, I think the mistake was they didn't, they didn't make their, well, whatever data and code they did do, and in this case, that was all in an Excel spreadsheet, they didn't make it publicly available. And that means it wasn't available for scrutiny by anybody else. So the paper then was just an advertisement for what they did. There was no way for anybody to check their working. And if you then compare this to the way the, math, you know, the mathematics community works, um, you know, you can't, you can't publish a paper to say, hey, this theorem's true. We checked it. It's true. People, yeah. nobody would accept that. They'd say, show us the proof so we can follow your line of reasoning. Um, and only then would the mathematics community accept a new theorem because you have the proof that other people can look at and reason over. Um, but in computational work in, you know, in engineering and you know, in other um, aspects of computational science, it's very common for us to just show the graph of our results. We don't show the analysis that went behind it in whatever tool it's done. And so um, I'm, I, I was sort of suggesting that, that along with the publications, um, you should also always release whatever code and data went behind making those results so that if you have made mistakes, somebody can go and find it because they can read what you've done. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, of course, what I'm describing here is an open source approach, but I'm, this is a very pragmatic reason to do it. it it's, uh, it's just saying, what, however you've analyzed it, just put your, your scripts out there, um, even if they're just Excel scripts, uh, sorry, Excel spreadsheets, just put them out there so other people can look at them. So being open is the first thing I think that you need to do. Whatever analysis you've done, make it available. Um, and the way that I suggest everybody makes all their stuff available is to put it on GitHub. Every computational paper should have a GitHub repository or Bitbucket or, you know, whatever it is that, uh, you know, if you, if you don't want to use GitHub for whatever reason, um, but put it out there in a form that you can attach to the paper so that other people can then look at it and, uh, check your work, see how you've done things, critically reason. Um, and then when they look at that, they can then decide whether or not they, they agree with your um, assumptions. Because if you don't do that, then I feel that all you're doing is advertising what you think you did um, rather than, you know, actually, it's not science unless you release all the code and data. That's, that's, that's I guess, what I'm saying. Certainly. I, I probably assume there would be someone in the comments saying, well, Mike works for MathWorks and well, MATLAB is known to be kind of a black box, let's say. Um, it's not as open source as Python, for example. People would argue, especially engineers. How much does MathWorks do for kind of the open science or open source projects in that sense? Can you maybe walk us through some of the projects that you've worked on, which are open source slash open science? Um, I think so. So that's a... Uh... That's a very big question, and I and we, we have to separate. I, I guess what uh, what I've personally done with what MathWorks does, um, you know, for example. Um, I mean, certainly th this there's a lot of MATLAB that is black box. It's proprietary. It's uh, you know our sustainability model is uh, is to charge a, a software license, um, and because we have that sustainability model that allows us to do all kinds of things um, that, that benefit the open source community. So one example that I'm not directly involved with, but colleagues at MathWorks are, um, we work, um, we worked closely with the linear algebra community for many years. For example, you may have heard of something called LAPAC. Um, so LAPAC mm -hmm. is 
uh, LAPAC is the is essentially the fundamental library by which all matrix operations is done. Um, they they usually so, so the LAPAC standard is is written in it's either Fortran or C plus plus I forget now but some language like that. Um, and if you do, I mean any kind of data analysis in any language, then um, that uses matrices, which is pretty much everything. Sooner or later, you're going to be using LAPAC. Um, you might not know it because mm -hmm. if you if you ask your um, your software to calculate eigenvalues, you know you you don't think you're calling the LAPAC, LAPAC library, but you almost certainly uh, will be. Um, and MacBooks have contributed to that project for many years. If you go to the um, the, the LAPAC release notes, you'll see um, a, a shout out to some of my colleagues in, uh, in, in development. It's like a big thanks to these guys. Um, you know, so that's one part of open, of the way that, that MathWorks works with the open source community is that there are um, open source libraries that MATLAB is built upon and we contribute to those, um, you know, so that's, uh, and, and the reason why we, we can afford to contribute to those is because, um, you know, we, we, we have this, this business model of having a, of, um, people uh, paying for licenses to use our software. Um, but then at the other end of the, of, of the scale, we've got open source software that runs on top of MATLAB. Okay. So, you, um, if you go to the MATLAB file exchange, you'll see a lot of, from the level of individual functions that have been written by people out there and handed over for free, um, right up to huge toolboxes that have been in development for decades that have got you know thousands of lines of code and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and we help support the development of, uh, of some of those as well. Um, so uh, yeah, there's like a, a whole, continuum of things yeah that makes a lot of sense so one of the things i really like about your presentation was you kind of invented an, your own law which is kind of crouch's law first of all what is crouch's law in the first place and then maybe answering the question of we talked about quickly about like in one sentence about automating by using scripts and code and whatever you use matlab python etc and you suggest that you use high level languages to kind of automate tasks or use them for knowledge transfer which brings me to the question is first, maybe explain Crouch's law. And then um, there's this movement in engineering going on at the moment, which is kind of like using low code, like this, I would call it black box approach again, like how we know it as engineers from Simulink, for example, you have boxes that you kind of connect with nodes, etc. So how do you differentiate between high level languages, low code applications, and what should engineers use at the end of the day? Okay. A lot of questions there. Um, so first of all, Crouch's law. Um, the 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 way that I like to set that up when I give the presentation is um, I say, okay, let's talk about Crouch's law. Now my name is Mike Croucher, and I've created a law called Crouch's law. So how arrogant am I, right? And um, and then I'll say, you know, when I first uh, gave this presentation to my uh, my fiance, and said, this is what I plan on talking to the engineers. Um, she stopped me and said, are you serious? You're going to make a law about yourself. Um, it's the height of arrogance and so on. And then she saw what Croucher's law was and said, oh, fair enough. No, I think I completely agree with that. Because Croucher's law is, um, uh, I can be an idiot and I will make mistakes. Um, and mm. this is, if you like, the, the premise of all of the software engineering practices that go on to follow. Um, but Croucher's law has a corollary. And that is you are no different. You or anybody else, we can all be idiots and we can all make mistakes. Um, yeah. And, and essentially the, the reason, it, it might seem like a really obvious thing to say, but when you start to introduce software practices, such as my favorite, which is uh, uh, version control, and then after version control, it will be mm -hmm. uh, you know, applying testing. You mention these to some people and they'll say, oh, I don't need to do that because I'm really, really careful. And so, you know, I, I, that, that, this has been an argument that's been said back to me. Um, I'll say, seriously, if, if, 
if you believe that you're so careful that you can never make mistakes, then I can't help you. And I'm not sure anybody can. I think it, you, you, you have to uh, have the error of your ways demonstrated to you by example, <laughs> um, you know, before you can actually change your working practices. So I go on to say, essentially, you, you have to accept that Crouch's law is true. Um, mm -hmm. Because once you accept that, you then say, okay, given that, I can be an idiot and I, I'm going to make mistakes. What can I do to mitigate that? What can I do to make sure that when I make the mistake, it gets caught as quickly as possible? Because, you know, science is a messy affair. And so is engineering to a certain degree, right? We, when we're doing something new, we stumble around, we make mistakes, we, we learn from those mistakes and so on. And so a, a lot of the advice that I've given over the years is pretty much find those mistakes as quickly as possible. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and things like version controlled and unit testing and other software engineering practices help, help lead to that. Yeah, we might go in a little bit more detail in a couple of minutes. Um, and then I talked about kind of this high, high language, high level language usage versus low code language. Why do you advise people to use high level language and like kind of write out the code? Uh, is it also maybe a technique to find mistakes as fast as possible when you write out code? Kind of. So, language? Yeah. So really the, the, the advice there is when I say high level language, I mean something like MATLAB or Python or R compared to something mm -hmm. like Fortran or C or C++. Right. That's what I mean by a high level. Language. Yeah. And there has been research done that, that shows that it doesn't matter what language you choose to use. Your average coder will write a certain number of lines of code per hour, per minute, whatever your unit of time is. Um, and the fact is you can get a lot more done in 10 lines of MATLAB than you can in 10 lines of C. Okay, so I'm mm -hmm. saying, oh, use a high level language because it's more productive for, for the programmer. Okay, so, you know, um, and I can already hear all kinds of fans of other languages of C or C++ in, in your audience getting upset by that. Um, but, you know, since the explosion of these high level languages, um, it's made many more engineers and, and researchers have been doing a lot more coding, right? Now it's kind of democratized coding um, because you can, you can do your programming in these high level languages. You don't need to learn C or C++. Um, and then to answer your question about low code, um, back when I first started giving this is your research software correct um, presentation, um, the idea of low code didn't really exist, but we, we did talk about using graphical user interfaces to do your analyses. Um, you know, so, so people would, uh, they would load their data in and then they would, you know, click around on the menus and say, okay, um, I want to take that column and I want to do a t-test on it and then I'll take this and do some other analysis on it and whatever. And then they write down in their Word document, um, you know, we took column five of the data and did a t-test on it um, and so on and so forth. And the reason why I didn't like that is because I would say, how reproducible is that workflow you've just done? It isn't. And indeed, would give examples of how um, papers had to be retracted because people who had used graphical user interfaces and had actually clicked on the wrong thing. Um, so they wrote down, you know, I, I did a t-test, but actually they'd accidentally clicked on something else. So the number that came out of the data was totally unrelated. It was, um, so it would be interesting because you would have like people argue, you'd have statisticians argue over papers would say, oh, they've taken a, frequentist approach, they should have taken Bayesian and, you know, all of these quite deep mathematical arguments. And it's like, dude, it's a lot worse than that. They're not even doing what they said they did because, you know, they, they made a mistake. They clicked on the wrong thing. They wrote down the wrong number. And so I sort of argue, how reproducible is a mouse click? It's not rep reproducible at all. Um, you need something that you can share. And so when we then go back to the low code, Things, which is almost like a, a modern take on these graphical user interfaces, right? Because you can, uh, 
you don't have to write any code, but you can, you can do a lot of analyses. I've got no problem with low code solutions as long as there's some way to make it reproducible. And the way that the MATLAB does that is that you've got your graphical user interface, your apps, your uh, live tasks, and so on. And you can, you can click around, you can do the analysis. And then when you're happy, once you've got something that you believe in, you can click on generate code. And then you can share that code mm -hmm. as the reproducible artifact. So I think- That's really cool. Yeah, th th and, that, and that's really where I, I sort of come down on all of this. As long as there's something that you can share that somebody could, given your input data or your input starting set of values for a simulation, they can, they can, they can take that and they can push it through something, whether it be some code, a simulink model, whatever, and the answer can come out the other side, then, um, th then, it, then it's fine. Um, you know, so, yeah. Then, then that makes a lot of sense, Mike. But then people would argue, especially what I see, I can talk only for the engineers. I might say, well, Mike, but time to execute the code. Like I wanna, I don't wanna sacrifice the time to execute the code. What would your counter argument for that be? Like, should you actually optimize for time when you start to code or like when you actually are an engineer and write code? Is that the correct way to, to see coding? I, I, I see what you mean. Um, well, well, because some people might say these high level languages are slow compared to low level languages or whatever. Yeah, so that kind of, correct. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, f first of all, high level languages are getting faster all the time. If you look at modern MATLAB, for example, it's so much faster than the MATLAB of even five years ago, and it gets faster all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I kind of, an, an, an hour of your time as an engineer is worth a lot more than a couple of hours of compute time. Um, so the, the, pro, the, the what's important is to be able to get something that's correct as fast as possible. And um, the high level languages allow you to do that. Um, if speed is an issue, you can always optimize it after the fact. Um, and, and indeed, even now, some of my work at, at MathWorks is to, is to help people at high performance computing centers to optimize their code and so on. And a much more, if you think of a productive use of time, science, scientists and engineers will often send me some code that they've written that only they could have written. There's no chance I could have done it. I don't have the domain knowledge. And they'll say, this mm -hmm. is slow. And many times I can make it faster, just like while I'm drinking a cup of coffee, I can say, oh yeah, I've seen what they've done. That's a common mistake that programmers make make that a bit faster, send it back to them. It's 10 times faster. It's a hundred times faster, whatever. They go away learning a new technique. And it was a correct division of labor. They didn't, you know, they did all the hard stuff. And then I just did a couple of tweaks at the end to help make it, make it go fast. Um, another way of, of viewing time taken for programming is some people don't like to automate tasks that they do they do a via graphic user interface because they'll argue there's even an XKCD comic on this. They'll argue that, um, you know, it took me five minutes to do it via graphical user interface. It took me three hours to write the code to do it. So they'll say it's a waste of time. I could, you know, um, and my counter argument to that is don't think of, automation of right as, as a time saving technique. It's a transfer of knowledge. Okay. You, um, yeah. If you know how to do an analysis by clicky, 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 clicking, I don't know how to do that analysis, but if you were to take the time to get the code to me somehow, then, you, then it's a way of you saying, this is everything you need to know to do what I can do. You're transferring knowledge to me. Um, and by working in that way, uh, you can then start to use the talents of different members of your team, you know, because uh, I don't need you to go through, you know, to, to take me through that analysis every time. You could perhaps send it to me and say, I need this to go a bit faster. You could perhaps send it to somebody else and say, we need a, use, a graphical user interface around this. Um, you know, you can start to separate things out. Um, so yeah. Writing code is a transfer of knowledge, not, not just a way of, um, you know, an automation. It's a transfer of knowledge, not just a way of making your, your life faster. 
And if we look into the future or like the current stage, like how people using MATLAB would actually code when we go back to this this point of accessibility and collaboration. Oh, okay. Because when I recorded this Matt GPT video, when you go to GitHub, you kind of use version control, as we talked about. You kind of have this little button there saying open in MATLAB online, which kind of goes back to more accessible, more collaborative. So how does MathWorks approach kind of these problems that you've talked about, uh, Mike? Yeah, no, I see what you mean. Um, yeah, okay. So um, I, I think if... if Let's say your starting point is you've got a, um, a few MATLAB M files um, or you've got a Simulink model or whatever, and you're using that and you want to start doing better. Okay? The, the first step in that direction, in my opinion, is version control. Always get it under version control. I could give a whole seminar on why I think version control is a good idea. Okay? But for now, let's just take it, the, you know, think about one route, which is the accessibility. Once you start using Git, for example, with MATLAB, um, which is very straightforward these days, um, you can then very easily upload it to GitHub, um, and, you know, and make it. Once you've done that, you've, you, your code is now available to everybody. Or you can keep it private and just make it available to people in your consortium of collaborators or whatever. You, know, you can control the level of open mm -hmm. that you are. Um, so. Just by taking on board this one um, very important technique from software engineering, which is version control, you've automatically made your work open, um, you know, because it's on it's on GitHub. You could then, if you were in a MATLAB context, if you wanted to make it more easily available to other MATLAB users, you can connect your GitHub repository to the MATLAB file exchange. And it will do this automatically. So every time you release something new on GitHub, it automatically publishes to the file exchange. And the reason why you want to do mm -hmm. that is that when somebody in MATLAB clicks on the add-ons section in the MATLAB desktop, they'll be able to search, you know, they search for whatever it is they want, and maybe they'll find your code. Okay, so already you're now uh, more useful to other MATLAB users. It's, they're more likely to use your code. Your code's more likely to have an impact um, on other people, it's more likely to be cited and so on and so forth. And all you've done to get all of this is start using version control. Okay. Um, the next thing that we, we, uh, we did fairly recently was we added this workflow that you mentioned, opening MATLAB online. So by adding mm -hmm. um, now an extra badge to your GitHub repository, somebody that comes, that comes to your repository can say, ah, oh, this analysis, look, this analysis looks really interesting. They just click on that button. They don't even need to have MATLAB installed. Now it will open in MATLAB online in the web browser. They can use it. Um, and so it's even more accessible and, and even more open. But you see, in order to make use of all of, of all of that good stuff, all you did was start using version control, you know, and, and then everything else follows from that. So I kind of like say, I mean, you know, if even one person watching this podcast were to contact us afterwards and say, yeah, I wasn't using version control before I saw you guys, but after this conversation, you said it so many times that, okay, I started using it and here's my GitHub repo. If even one person does that, I'm going to be like super happy because uh, uh, yeah, I think, I think all the good stuff stems from using version control. Um, you know, and then there's a lot, there's several other much more advanced workflows that then, you know, stem from, from that. But, but already, all you've done is start using version control, you get your stuff on GitHub, and lots of other stuff comes almost for free just by doing that. Yeah. One thing um, I want to ask you, Mike, is more like we talked about knowledge transfer, which I really like the idea of actually not using it as an automation tool, but more like a knowledge transfer tool. Let's talk maybe about a mindset shift that maybe has to happen because a lot of people think, well, it's my IP. It's kind of, I studied for several years. I'm an engineer now. I don't want to share my intellectual property with other people. Like, what do you think an engineer has to go through in terms of a mindset shift to actually be more open and more collaborative in that aspect? Well, I mean, of course, th th there are always times when you need to protect your IP sometimes. It depends in what domain you're working in, right? Um, I, yeah. So I, I've, I've got very little experience with working in industry. All of my experience has been working with the academic community. Even now, 
in MathWorks, I specialize in academia, um, you know, in, in research mm -hmm. and in teaching and so on. Um, and in the, you know, in the academic space, what, certainly what matters in the UK, I can't speak even for other countries, but what matters in the UK is we have this idea of research impact. How much impact did your research have in the world? And it's when you're actually writing research mm -hmm. grants for many of the funders, you have to write what's called a, a research impact case study. You know, if my project is funded, this is how it's going to change the world. This is the impact that it's going to make. And I think that by by making your uh, the, your your analysis, your algorithms, and so on, um, putting them online on GitHub and making them open in this way, so that more people can use it, you're more likely to get that impact. Okay, um, and so I think really that yeah that that's that's how I think you should think about it, um, and. Yeah. If perhaps if you're working in industry and you know in and um, there are other reasons why you've you've developed uh, your algorithm or whatever, um, you know you ha you haven't. It's not part of research. It's part of like a, a something that you're, you're you're working on in you know to produce a product or whatever. Then perhaps you behave in a different way. Um, yeah. I'd like to say you should you should, you should be as as open as is sensible for what you for for what your um your what you want to achieve. Yeah, that makes that a lot make of sense. sense. Um, we talked about that makes it yeah makes absolute sense to me. We talked about uh, the version control right now. Um, one of the anecdotes I have when writing my master thesis, for example, when you use frameworks like TensorFlow, or whatever, um, sometimes the dependencies uh, change. For example, are there some other things that you encounter on a day to day basis? Maybe even students where you could give the listeners to the podcast kind of tips on maybe how to fix the issue with um, changing dependencies, virtual machines, uh, containerization, for example, a few tips that you could tell the audience of what they maybe should explore if they want to become better coders. Yeah. So dealing with dependencies is a, is a, is a big problem, in, uh, you know, as you said. Um, and I, I think that it's one that hasn't really been solved fully in any language. Um, you know, mm. In, in, in MATLAB, to a certain degree, uh, things are made easier by the fact that um, if you were to say, I used, you know, release 2023B, then you've already, you know, uh, I've used release 2023B on a Mac, then you've already set down a lot of your dependencies, you know, that, that's a uh, fairly well defined there. It gets more complicated when mm -hmm. you start using some of the open toolboxes um, you know, from the file exchange or whatever, because then you have to think, you know, which version of this have I used, which version of that have I used. Um, and, you know, similarly, like in, I don't know, uh, my fiance uses R a lot because she's a statistician. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the issues that she has to deal with is that all the packages on CRAN, they, 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 they change like constantly. And if you've got a, a very large project that uses a lot of packages, And sometimes, it, you know, the project will run today and not tomorrow. Um, but there are ways of, of managing that as well. And essentially, all of these ways come down to recording, making some effort to record what your environment is. Um, what are all the different versions of all of the packages that you're using? Um, and this can be, yeah. uh, can then be automated in, in various ways so that... Um, you can say to somebody, uh, not only are you going to run my code, but you're going to run it using the same set of packages that I ran, whether that be in, you know, in, in Python or R or MATLAB or whatever. There are ways of doing that. And I think that's kind of like, if you're starting to depend on lots of other packages, then sooner or later, you need to start thinking about describing your environment as well. Um, and I think level one is... Uh, you know, listing, uh, list, listing all the versions of the packages that you do in some machine readable way. Um, I don't know if it's still around, but there was something called the MRAN, for example, for R, that um, it, was done by, mm -hmm. it was done by Microsoft, I think. Um, and uh, the, the, there was a way where essentially you could set the, you could set the date where you could say, um, 
I'm, I'm going to use all the packages that were, all of these packages, whatever version they were on the, um, the, the 8th of November, 2023, they're the versions that I want you to download. And, you know, and it would take care of it all automatically somehow. And then you have you know, similar systems um, in, in PIP for Python and you know, MATLAB and so on. Um, so that's, that's like level one. Then level two is to think about doc, is containerization, and, you know, if you need to do that. Um, the, the, to a certain extent, you kind of need to, it, it, it's, it's an engineering call. Um, how deep down this particular rabbit hole do you want to go? Um, if you're writing like a very small script that doesn't have many dependencies, you, then a docking container is probably too heavy. Um, you know, if you've got a huge number of, of, of dependencies, um, you know, across many files that you're collaborating on simultaneously with many people, then maybe it is the right way to go. Um, and I think that just being aware of the options is the best that you can hope most people to do. You know, there's no hard and fixed way of saying you, you should always use Docker for this and you should always, you know, just list your dependencies and, and use MRAN or or whatever for that. Um, I think you just need to be aware of the alternatives. What do you think? Do, do you agree mm -hmm. with that or do you think there's a, another way? How I usually have done it is just list all the, the things that I've installed with PIP, for example, in my master thesis. And then if someone would like to use the code, they kind of have a list of what they should install, kind of a requirements.txt file. Exactly. I guess yeah. I think that's the, yeah. yeah. I think that's the most straightforward way. Um, any other tips that we that we missed? What do you think about a code buddy, Mike? Is it more for code students buddy. or do you even see that happening in the industry? I'm, I'm not sure if that's actually a thing in the industry, having a code buddy. Uh, I see. So, okay. So, um, yeah, again, in that presentation, I, I, I came up with a list of pieces of advice um, for helping mm -hmm. make your research uh, software be more likely to be correct. And one of them, I said, get a code buddy. And what I mean by that, what we would say in, in, you know, in, in industry is code review. So in industry, we do code review. Okay. And so, for mm -hmm. example, yep. at, at MathWorks, anybody that works in development, there's a formal code review process. Um, and, uh, you know, so a developer will write something. It doesn't end up in the code, in the, you know, in the, in the MathWorks code base until it's been reviewed. Um, I don't work in development. I don't know what our um, code review process looks like, but I have you know, worked in various places that have a code review process and it can be a bit, a bit it can be quite stressful and, and also it can be a very formal process. But in the context of research, I say, let's take the idea of formal code review and just make it a bit more informal. And so what I mean by that is you essentially send your code to somebody else Say, hey, Bob, Jane, whoever, will you take a look at this? And then just see what they say. And something that I've, I've learned over the years is that you don't actually need to know anything about the, the subject domain to be able to say something useful. So if, you know, if you were mm -hmm. an expert in, I don't know, semiconductor physics or whatever, and you wrote a very long MATLAB script to do the analysis, if they then sent that code to me or you, we'd be able to look at it and we'd be able to say at least something, you know, um, it's like, oh, that's really weird how you, are you sure global variables, are you sure? <laughs> you know, um, and it, it is, in, in my experience, when you let a second person look at your code, you end up learning something. Um, and, and so really that's what I mean by a code buddy, just send your code to somebody else. And, and say to them, take a look at this and let me know what you think. Um, and it's, yeah, so informal code review. Um, it, yeah, you have been coding for quite actually, some time, Mike, right? Yeah. So you have been co coding for quite some time, Mike. How do you personally do it? Do you also have a code buddy or do you just say, well, I've been coding for a lot of time, but then Crouch's law comes kicks in, right? Because you at some point will make a mistake. So how do you personally deal with it? Um, yeah, so um, the, okay, so I'm at MathWorks, I'm what's called a customer facing engineer, which means pretty much what it says on the tin. I, I, I write mm -hmm. code that, that um, uh, doesn't go in the MATLAB product. It's I write code that demonstrates stuff for customers, um, or I work on customer mm -hmm. code. 
And any code that I write, I'll share with other members of my team, certainly the demos. Um, so, so yeah, I still have, we still, I still use code buddies now. So I wrote this, what you think? And other people will look at it and they, they, they pass judgment. And, um, and he did, so I also, I, I'm the author of the MATLAB blog. Um, so I write code for the MATLAB blog. And it's, uh, mm-hmm. for me, it, it's quite a scary experience because the head of product management at MathWorks has to personally approve all of my blog posts. So when you see any MATLAB code um, in there, it's been read by like the Jedi master of MATLAB programmers. And, um, mm-hmm. and she's picked out some real embarrassing mistakes in my code. Of, you know, So I've written something where I've said, hey, uh, you know, audience of, uh, of the MathWorks blogs, I've written some code that I really want you to look at and it's contained mistakes. It's contained things that uh, we should never advise. Um, we should never advise customers to do. I've used deprecated functions. I've used terrible function names, all kinds of things, like some really embarrassing stuff. She'll come back and say, do you really not know this? And I'm like, oh, no, I didn't know that at all. Um, so it's a humbling experience, but at, at the same time, it, 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 the whole point of doing this is so that you don't make mistakes and that you learn something. So yeah, even after doing this kind of thing now for 20 years, I still have code buddies. Almost every line of code that I write will get looked at by somebody else. Um, even if that's a very informal, just scanning over it. Um, yeah, it's, it's almost always useful. So I'd suggest find somebody that you can have this reciprocal relationship with um, and, and do an informal swap of your code, definitely. Yeah, that, that's a good tip, Mike, thanks. Um, you mentioned testing a couple of minutes ago. Could you quickly explain to the audience because some of the engineers are not familiar with people listening to this podcast. What, it, what is testing in the first place and when and why do we need it? Okay, um, so you've written a function. Let's say you've written it in MATLAB and you wanna know if it gives the right answer or not. If you don't care if it gives the right answer, then you don't need testing. If you think that the right the right answer matters, then you need testing. Um, now, what typically you, people will start doing is we've all done this on the command line, right? We've written a function. We've got some ideas in our head about if I send the number one to this function, I'll get this result. If I send this data set to that function, I know I'm going to get this answer. And we do it manually. You know, we'll type the function in. We'll press enter and we'll see if it gives the result that we expect. We've all done that at the command line. I guess you've done it too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so um, and so all testing is to a first approximation is just automating that. You actually you write what you, you write your function out, you give it some example input data, and you make sure that um, the code gives you the output that you expect. I mean, there's a, there's a whole area of software development called test-driven development where you uh, you write the yeah. tests first. You write the tests first, and then you write the, the code that adheres to that. Um, I personally don't like that. Um, I've got no good reason to say why I don't like it. It's just not how my mind works. Um, there are tons you know of what, You reasons. know what? That's funny, Mike. It, you know what? That's funny, Mike, because my brothers are software engineers, and they hate testing, like test-driven development. They hate it, but they yeah. never... Gave me a reason. No, no, I mean, yeah, I can't give you a good reason. There, there, are, there are lots of people out there, I'm sure, who are saying that test-driven development is the way to do software engineering. And, and I might say, yeah, it could be. It's just not the way my mind works. I, I sort of write the, the, mm-hmm. the code first and then write the tests. And writing tests, it's a pain, right? Because you have to do extra work. And indeed, in most cases, you can write a really small function. So a small function that's like, you know, it looks like this on the screen. And the tests, there's loads of them. Um, you know, and, and so it, it's a pain to do, but when you do do it, it, it gives you, um, uh, so it, it gives you the confidence then to start making changes because you can make changes every time, as you're refactoring your code and making changes, so have I broken anything? No, it's still all fine. How about now? Have I broken anything? No, it's still all fine. Um, so, it gives you the confidence to make changes. And indeed, some of my favorite projects to work on when I'm working with customers are ones that have got a test suite because typically they'll come to me because they want some modifications made and they'll say, hey, can you make it faster, for example? And um, I can then pretty much do whatever crazy stuff enters my head 
Um, and I can say, right, I've done some really crazy stuff. I rewrote some huge sections of your code, but your test suite still passes. So we can be confident that I've not broken anything, even though I have no idea what it is you're doing. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And then the, the next the next level of testing, if you like, is something called continuous integration and continuous development, which is where you combine testing with version control. So that's when every time you then uh, update your code on GitHub, it automatically runs all of your tests and tell you whether you've passed or not. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I kind of see that all of these techniques, they kind of add on top of each other. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the and then the end result is 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 much bigger than the sum of the parts. It's always a, a really good thing to do. Yeah, cool. Thanks for explaining, Mike. Uh, one of the last things I want to talk about, Mike, before we wrap up the podcast is kind of overcoming challenges with MathWorks, like when you use MATLAB, Simulink, and all the other packages that exist out there from MathWorks. It's more like I talked to Jan and Heather about this kind of this Python versus MATLAB battle. Um, what can people expect when they use um, products from MathWorks, we're, whether we talk about the products, the consultancy that's kind of included implicitly, the training, research, and which I personally really like, also the very strong and helpful community. Maybe you could talk to that a little bit more um, to the community out there who maybe want to try MATLAB because they haven't tried it yet. Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly, as I was saying before, the, the, the sustainability model of the MathWorks is that we, we, we charge a license fee um, and that gives you access to our software, but it also gives you access to all of the math workers. Um, the, the, the first stage of that is, um, you know, if you, if you have any problems with installation or whatever, you can just email support or phone someone up and say, I'm having a problem and so on. Um, within academia, there's a whole team of people just like me who, uh, who, whose role is to help academics make use, make better use of MATLAB in teaching and research. So we've got a worldwide team of people where if you were to say, I'm at the university of whatever, we've got a MATLAB license um, and I'm teaching, uh, you know, introduction to optimization using MATLAB and I'd like some advice on how to use it better. We'll be there for you. We, we can, uh, we can help you do that. There's all kinds of extra work um, that we can do. We write um, in research, we, uh, we help support research projects. And so um, at the, uh, University of York, for example, which is one of the universities that I look after in the UK, um, we uh, are one of their industrial partners on what's called a CDT, a Centre for Doctoral Training. Um, mm -hmm. And we wrote, when they were at the grant funding stage, we wrote a letter of support for them about how this project was, uh, we thought it was really interesting what they were doing, how we wanted to support it, how we would help them out, how it was important for industry as well as academia and so on and so forth. So there are all different ways that we interact with the academic community. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned this in, in connection with, uh, with Python. Before I joined MathWorks, I was a, both a MATLAB programmer and a Python programmer for many years. I've got a lot of respect for Python. I know a lot of people in the, in the Python community. Um, I was at JupyterCon earlier this year in Paris and it felt like a reunion to me because uh, uh, I like knew loads of the people that were there, um, it, and uh, you know it, it was it was great because we were we were telling everybody about the new um, uh, Jupyter kernel for MATLAB. So that you know the fact that you can now run MATLAB mm -hmm. in Jupyter, um, and you know we've got a lot for Python people as well. You can use Python code in MATLAB. You can use MATLAB code in Python. Um, I've got a, a seminar that I'm doing with my colleague, um, Maria Gavilan, um, later in November, that will be about using MATLAB and Python together. Um, and so, you know, really, I don't know, it, it, it's more about what problems do you have to solve? Um, and there's usually something in the, in, in the, in the MathWorks ecosystem of tools that, um, that can help you do that. Um, when people use MATLAB and Python in the same language, they're typically, in the same sentence, sorry, they're typically thinking about MATLAB as a programming language. But it's so much more than that. You know, it's a, it's also a desktop. It's a workflow tool. Um, it's got Simulink. It's got Simscape. It's got code generation tools. You can write code in, in MATLAB and get them automatically converted to C and C++. And you know, this is used hugely um, in, in, in industry. Um, and you can integrate it 
with all kinds of other languages of which Python's one. So, you know, when when I say MATLAB, I don't just mean the language. I think of the whole system of tools around it. Um, does that answer your question? I kind of feel like I've branched off all over the place. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I really, yeah. I kind of want to talk uh, want to talk uh, more about the support system, which you kind of answered, Mike. So really appreciate that. Um, to give this podcast and maybe to wrap it up, kind of give it a more uh, Shark Tank esque vibe. I want to ask you, like, if people are not sure what programming language they should use, and you have to pitch MATLAB for a minute, so please go ahead, Mike, and tell the audience out there why they should use MATLAB over Python or other languages. Can I not answer that? I really don't want to get into. Uh, uh, um, you don't I, want I to don't get into get, trouble. No, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. Uh, and, and if we can, just not include that in the podcast because I think that um, uh, I don't. I really don't believe in language wars, and in um, and I think that anything that I might say there, use MATLAB and not Python because of this, this, and this, is just going to cause an argument, and it's not. A, it's not a ground that I want to get into. Any recommendations out there to the community? Maybe some some motivating words and um, how they should maybe take action for open science. What would your recommendation be, Mike? Okay. The last word so, goes to you. Thank you. So my recommendation then would be whatever language you're using, whether it be MATLAB or Python or R or whatever it is you use, start using version control. That would be my first piece of advice. Whatever it is you're doing, start using version control. Um, if open science is your thing, get it on GitHub, start making use of, uh, um, you know, you can start making use of some of the other technologies that I mentioned before, the connection to the file exchange, mm -hmm. the open MATLAB online and so on. So yeah, I think whatever it is you're doing, version control, that's that's the beginning of all the good stuff. If you were just to do one thing, start doing that. Mm -hmm. What would be your, your one piece of advice to be actually become a better coder? Is it just practicing at the end of the day or is there something else that you would recommend to to the audience? Um, practice is certainly part of it. Getting feedback from other people. So the code buddy thing, doing that as much as possible, yep. um, uh, would be, would be a good thing. Um, try and get a mentor, um, you know, if you can, um, and put your code out there. Um, is, so, so the, if your code is out there, it's on GitHub or whatever, and people start using it, they'll start finding problems. Um, all code has bugs, um, you know, um, and when other people start using it, they'll find those bugs and they'll report them and you'll need to fix them. And um, they'll also start having suggestions. And by, by interacting with the community this way, you'll start becoming a better coder. Um, and then you'll also find that if your project's interesting enough, other people will start contributing to it. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll mm -hmm. look at the code and they'll they'll realize that actually if you did it this way or that way, then it would be better. And they'll start making suggestions. So, again, I, you know, it comes back down to, well, if you started using version control and you put it up on GitHub, <laughs> you're going to start getting better. It's the first step to everything. So I'm just going to keep but circling it's, it's probably... around that particular thing. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's probably out of some people's comfort zone, but definitely very good advice. I wish I would have done that earlier in my bachelor's and master's. So yeah, we are almost at one hour, Mike. Thank you so much, by the way, for being on the podcast. And maybe there will be a second part in the future about another topic, who knows? Um, but yeah, thank you so much. And then uh, talk to you hopefully soon, maybe via thank Twitter or much. LinkedIn, whatever. I don't know. Yeah, it is. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. Take care.